What's going on engineers? In this next video in the Let's Run Rust series, we're going to be looking at structs, also known as structures, and also traits. Structs in Rust are similar to structs in C and C++ in that they contain a group of related properties. However, unlike C structs, Rust allows you to also take it a step further and add methods onto your struct, which can be called upon that struct itself. Traits, on the other hand, are collections of methods that can be attached to a struct when they're needed. However, to use a trait in an effective and generic way, there's a couple rules that have to be followed. The most particular one is that if there are trait methods that are not fully filled out, then they are required to be implemented when you attach them to the struct. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So let's jump in and look at some examples. There's three types of structs we're going to look at today. The first is going to be a C-style struct, which looks just like they would look like in C. Also, tuple-style structs and then unit structs. To make a C style struct is very simple. Use the struct keyword and then specify the type name. So in this case, I'm just going to call it data and then specify curly braces. Inside here, I have to go ahead and specify each property and then the type of the property. So I can do something like num1, you know, i32, b32 bit integer, you know, maybe a second number, you know, i32. But they don't all have to be the same type. I can do something like string1, which will be a string, and I can even specify something like a option with an i32. You could also even place structs in structs if you wanted to. For a tuple style struct, it starts out kind of the same. Use the struct keyword and then you type the name, but rather than using curly braces, use parentheses and then you specify the types of the tuple. So if it's two numbers, I'll do i32 comma i32. The last struct is going to be a unit struct, and this one is really useful for if you have collections of common functionality and you just need a placeholder to hold it. So in this case, I'll do struct calculator and then this is going to have no properties in it. Later on in the video, we'll make that a little more useful. Now, before we move on to actually adding methods to these structs, it's worth showing exactly how to use a struct in your code. If you want to actually use a struct, you can do something like let a, or whatever the name is, and you specify the type name. So if I want to make a new struct of data, I would do data. Now I'd specify curly braces, and then inside here, I need to specify every property and every value for every property. So I'd have to do like num1, you know, it was four, num2 is three, you know, string one is, you know, whatever, dot two string. And then for the optional, you know, num, I would have to specify either a, you know, either a none type or a sum type. If you need to reference properties in the struct from your code, you can specify things like a.num1, a.num2, or a.str1. If we want to use a tuple struct, it's almost the same, except we do the type name, you know, which is two nums, and then instead of curly braces, of course, we use parentheses, and instead of all the properties, we just specify the numbers. So two nums just takes two numbers, and we'll do like a four and a three, and that's all it takes to do that. If you want to access the numbers in a tuple struct, it's a little different. Instead of reference, of course, there's no name to reference it by, so the way you got to reference it is by index. So like d.0 is going to be a four, and then d.1 is going to be the 3. As far as the unit struct goes, our unit struct calculator, we can't really do much of that right now because it's empty and it has no methods, so we're just going to not do anything with that just yet. Okay, next we're going to look at is actually implementing methods onto a struct. This is going to be a way of adding functionality that uses the properties in the struct to do something special. To implement methods onto a struct, you use the impl keyword and then you specify the type. And then inside the curly braces, you specify the actual methods that you want to add to the struct. So imagine we want a method that would sum two numbers. In this case, num1 and num2. We could do something like fn sum. We can have it return an i32. And then inside here, we have our body. So as far as the sum goes, the first thing we have to do is actually specify a reference to the struct itself. And that's going to be done with ampersand self. And then in here, what we can do is we can reference num1 and num2 with that self keyword. So if we want to return the sum of two numbers, we can do self.num1 plus self.num2. So now that we've implemented a method sum on type data, we can come back down here where our struct is used. We can do something like print ln. And if we want to print the actual sum of those two numbers, we can actually call a.sum. We can come over to our terminal, run our program, and we can see that it says seven, which is as expected. Now there's another type of method you can implement onto a struct, and it's one that is not actually called from an instance of that struct, but it's actually part of the type itself, meaning you can call it directly with like data colon colon then the name of the method. 
And I'm gonna show you a way where this is really useful. So one thing I didn't mention before is that when you create a struct from a type, you must specify every property in that struct. This is problematic because what if all the values in your struct could have default values? You obviously don't want to specify all the defaults every time you create a new struct. So a common way to solve this is to implement a new method called new and notice that I'm not putting self in here and that's because it's not an actual part of the instance, it's part of the type itself and then this is going to return an instance of itself. Now in this new method, I do have to return every property that is in that struct. However, I could specify some sensible defaults and I can make this as the method I call to generate a new struct. To use this, I use the double colon operator. So if I wanna create a new struct from that, I can do something like let c equals data colon colon new. Now if I wanted to modify one of the default values, I simply just name it c.num1 equals say three instead of two. Of course, the compiler does complain because it's not mutable, so I simply put the mute keyword and then it's happy again. And then, of course, as with my first usage of the struct, I still have access to the sum method, so I'm calling it here now. Now, Rust has one really neat trick which allows you to initialize one struct according to values of another struct. So if I want to make another struct called, uh, we'll say B, you know, and it'll be of type data. If I want to use all the properties of a previous struct except for one property, what I can do is I can specify the one property. So like if I want to modify num1, I can do num1, set that to like eight. And then if I want to use all the other properties from the previous struct, all I do is dot dot and then the name of the struct. So let's go ahead and run our program. Just make sure everything's functioning as expected. And it is. One more note about implementing methods is you don't have to do it all in one shot. So in this case, I used the impl keyword one time and I specified two methods, but if you wanted to break that up into two, you could do impl data a second time. So if you wanted to do just one per method, that's fine, or you can loop them all in, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so now we're looking back at our unit struct called calculator again. And all we're gonna do here is we're gonna implement some common methods that would be related to a calculator, particularly like add, subtract, multiply, and divide. So implementing methods this way starts out kind of the same. We do impl and then we specify the name of the type. And then here we're going to specify each method. So we'll start with add and then add is going to take a num1, which is an i32, a num2, which is an i32, and then it will re return an i32, which is just n1 plus n2. Now note that we're using n1 and n2 and not self.n1, self.n2. And that's because calculator has no properties, which means it has nothing to reference. So I'll just quickly add the other four that I planned on adding. You know, first one was add, next one's gonna be sub, and then multiply, and then divide. So of course we do minus here, and then we do multiply here, and then we do divide here, cast that as an F32, and then make it return F32 for a float. Now to use our calculator methods, we're gonna to have to call them with the double colon operator. So we specify the type, calculator, double colon, add, I'm gonna specify two numbers, and that's all I gotta do for that. And then of course the same is true for the other three methods, sub, mul, and div. We can run our program real quick and just make sure it still works. And it does. And now let's move on to traits. What we're gonna to try to do here is make a trait that adds some functionality to our type data to do something specific to that string one variable. The trait we're gonna make is gonna be called transform. And to make that, we use the keyword trait, transform, then curly braces. Inside here, what we have to supply is all the default methods as well as all the methods that are required to be implemented when you implement this trait onto a struct type. So the generic method that we're gonna implement is going to be a reverse method, which reverses something. So we can do function reverse, and then we can specify the self now we can say that this method's going to return a string. Now remember, this trait's generic. Notice that I didn't actually implement anything for rev, and that's because that's going to be done at the time that it's implemented onto a struct. And the reason this is necessary is because we don't know if we, we don't know what the person's going to use, like self.string1, could be self.vector, could be self.whatever. And it's going to be up to the developer to actually implement that. All we know is that the result from rev is going to be a string. Now, because we can guarantee that it will be a string, we can add another method that's going to be a default method that does not have to be re-implemented, something called like output rev, which also takes self, which returns nothing, but instead it prints out the actual result from that method. So we can call self.rev. Now to attach a trait onto a struct, the syntax is going to be impl, and then the name of the trait, 
for and then the name of the type. Now you can see the compiler is complaining and the error that it's complaining about is going to be missing rev and implementation. It's saying that not all trade items have been implemented. So no problem, let's go ahead and implement it. Inside here, we can specify the exact same signature from the trait, except in here, we have to actually supply some functionality for this. So we as the developer now are responsible to say what exactly this method should do. And we know we want to reverse the actual str1 variable, self.string1. So to do that, simply do self.string1.chars.rev.collect, specify the type, and that's it. So we can come back down here. It doesn't matter which one we use because it's implemented on all of them. So we'll just do C for instance. And what we'll do is we'll output C rev, but we can also just call C dot output rev. And it should do the exact same thing. So let's try it out and make sure. And it works as expected. Some string backwards twice. Now one note about traits is traits is a very popular piece of functionality in Rust, so much so that there's tons of built-in traits right into Rust. And because they're built in, it means that you too can take them, implement them onto your user types, and then specify custom functionality inside those traits. And that's really it for structures and traits. Traits is going to be something that you'll use every so often, but structures is going to be something that you're going to use a ton in Rust if you're composing really good programs. Now the one last note I want to make is that Rust does not have true object-oriented programming. The closest thing you're going to get to that is going to be using structs and traits effectively. When used together, you get a solution that's pretty close to object-oriented programming in other languages. And that's all. As usual, if you have any questions or comments about this video, make sure to put them below in the comments. Other than that, I hope to see you on the next video. Take care.